Okay, we're recording. Um, good afternoon. Uh, today we have a um, we're we're going to have a uh, Dr. Jordan Grummet, author of Taking Stock: A Hospice Doctor's Advice on Financial Independence, Building Wealth, and Living a Regret-Free Life. Um, Jordan launched the Earn and Invest podcast in 2019. In 2018, sorry, in 2019, he received the Plutus Award for Best New Personal Finance Podcast and was nominated in 2020 for Best Personal Finance Podcast of the Year. He's currently Associate Medical Director at Journey Care Hospice. He will be interviewed by Fred Honnold. Uh, Fred's background is his extensive global experience with organizations on all continents and within many cultures, first as a corporate practitioner and then as a consultant with corporations. Uh, as a lifelong learner, he has led, as a lifelong learner, Fred's curiosity has led him to explore various issues including those of personal finance and how to live life to its fullest. And he is an active library volunteer. Mm -hmm. So, Fred, you can go ahead. All right, thank you so much for that kind introduction, Rebecca. We are most fortunate to have here today, Dr. Jordan Grummet, as Rebecca referenced his book, uh, Taking Stock, was published by Ulysses in 2022. So it's just out, it's the first of what's most likely a series. And just to put it in broad context, uh, I am at the library often, I've had the good fortune doing pro bono work, working here with uh, Rebecca uh, in terms of areas of foreign policy. We began to talk about what the community would really benefit from all different cohorts, demographic ages, would be something on finance, uh, investment, uh, health and wealth combined. And as we talked about it and talking to Rebecca, we said, let's blend seminars with speakers that we bring in. And so we're very honored and very proud to bring in Dr. Jordan Grummet as our opening inaugural speaker. His book right here, Taking Stock, just out. Uh, there are two copies at the library, so please come and reserve or buy it online. But with that as background, let's get into our conversation. Uh, Dr. Grummet, Jordan, welcome. First of all, thank you, Fred, for having me. It is such a pleasure to be here to talk to the Summit Library community. Well, it's, a, it's really an honor to have you. And just by way of opening up uh, for our audience as we gather, this will be recorded. This will be accessible through the library website through a link. But as I page through Jordan's book here, uh, Jordan, just by way of framing things very broadly, it's divided into three broad parts. Part one, what financial independence experts get wrong about life and death? Jordan gets to the fundamentals. Part two, many paths to financial independence. And finally, part three, the one thing the dying wish they had more of, and that's time. Time is the one asset we can't buy more of. The question is, what do we do it? So Jordan, if we can start with your background, and if you can take us into really what inspired you to pursue a medical career and the personal story you share in the book about the tragedy that became, in a curious way, a gift of the life that you were leading. So basically, my father died when I was seven years old, and he was a prominent physician and oncologist or cancer doctor. And in the way most seven-year-olds do, I tended to see the life through my own lens. So I used to think that everything that happened in the world had something specifically to do with me. So seeing my father die, I thought that I was somehow responsible. And that was a very disconcerting feeling. In fact, it was something I struggled with as a little child. And at some point, I came to the conclusion that the way to make this better, to cosmically fix this bad thing that had happened in my life, that I should become a doctor just like him. And if I became a doctor and I was able to help people and carry on his good work, that would somehow relieve me of this responsibility that I so intimately felt. And so that was the only thing I ever thought I would do for a living. It was part and partial of my identity as a little kid, which was interesting because I also had a learning disability at the time. And 
when my peers were learning how to read, I was struggling to the extent that they had to take me out of regular classes, give me special tutors. A lot mm. of times I was coloring in coloring books while my peers were writing and reading because I just wasn't at the level they were. So strangely enough, that never made me think that being a doctor wasn't something I was going to do. It was so strongly ingrained in who I was that I never thought much about things like money or finances. I certainly never thought much about what any other purpose in my life was to be except to become a physician. And so over the years, with the help of a bunch of tutors, I got past my reading disability and I spent every moment possible studying and learning and getting into medical school and residency and that was the dream. And I often say it was the dream until I got there. It wasn't that I didn't love practicing medicine, but I quickly learned that the stresses, the anxieties, and just the sheer amount of paperwork and problems in our healthcare system were negatively impacting my way of dealing with this profession, this thing that I had thought was my purpose and identity. So I got to this point in my career where I started becoming incredibly burned out. And at some point I was really looking for a way out of medicine. I started asking myself this big question, a question I had never asked myself before. How do I have enough money that I don't need to work anymore? Mm -hmm. And that was kind of my genesis into diving into learning about personal finance and eventually writing this book. Very nice. And for people's background, when you use the word dream, this was not just a figurative term, but also a literal term. A few months after you your father's abrupt passing, you had a dream and it began to unfold. As I remember what you said, you grew up in the Chicago area, went to the University of Michigan, went on to Northwestern for med school, went to Washington University in residency and share the story in the, the book about how you were taken over the residency from another resident and what one of the head doctors had shared with you at that point. So this was one of those cracks in the armor of my identity as a physician one of my first questionings of what it meant to be a doctor and whether it was truly right for me, I was at the beginning of my internship year. So this is right after you get your MD. You've just finished medical school. We all are incredibly anxious because we're about to walk into the hospital and actually have to take care of patients. Mm -hmm. And my chief resident, that was the guy who was in charge of all the new interns, was walking me around and showing me the different parts of the hospital. And when we got to the last place, it was a medical ward and it was going to be where I started the next day. Mm -hmm. And he grabbed one of the residents who was in her, his third year of residency. And this resident was about to leave the hospital and enter the world of practicing physicians being done with training. And he said something that always stuck with me. He said, this is John. You're going to take over his patients. He can't be hurt anymore. And I remember that line, can't be hurt. And it really stuck with me. At the time, I didn't know what that meant. And I didn't know how that would fit into who I'd become. But I learned about a year later, I was a second year resident and I was the only doctor available in the ICU late at night. So when you work in the intensive care unit during the days, there are multiple doctors around. There's chief or attending physicians around to help you. But then everyone goes home and you take call. And in this small ICU I was in, I was the only doctor there left at night. And one of my fellow residents came to me and said, look, I'm taking care of this patient. I'm leaving. You're going to cover him overnight. He's in his 80s. He's short of breath. We don't know why. We have him on lots, lots of oxygen. Your job for the night is just to make sure he doesn't end up on a ventilator. And so... All the residents left and I was running around taking care of all the very sick patients in the ICU. And I kept on getting messages from the nurses. You know, so-and-so is not looking good. His oxygen levels aren't, aren't doing well. So I would go in see the patient, adjust a few things. But at some point around one or two in the morning, the nurse came to me and said, he's doing horribly. And so I looked at this patient. I said, okay, he clearly needs to be put on a ventilator. So if you know anything about medicine, the way you put a patient on a ventilator is you actually have to take a tube, stick it down their mouth through the throat into the trachea, basically towards the lungs so that you can then deliver air and oxygen to the lungs for the patient. And it's a technical procedure. You actually have to do what's called intubating a patient or putting that tube in. I was mediocre at it, right? I had done it somewhat, but I wasn't the best. And so the way we would do it is we would call anesthesia, who are the experts in doing this, 
And usually we would page them and they'd come five minutes later. We would get everything ready. We'd even maybe start. And if we were having any trouble, the anesthesiologist would swoop in and intubate the patient. And so I did exactly this. And I was having trouble getting the patient intubated, but the anesthesiologist never came. And so there's a way around this. You can take what's called an AMBU bag or a bag that we've all seen if you've watched ER or any of these shows in which we can breathe for the patient, but it's not ideal. Eventually you want to get that tube in. So I was keeping the oxygen levels okay, but I started getting progressively anxious. The minutes were passing. I kept on trying to pass the tube. I couldn't. I was yelling at the secretary, get the damn anesthesiologist here. What's going on? I'm sitting at the patient's bedside, but yelling through the hallways. At some point, a fellow resident walks by, sees that I'm struggling, runs in. We work together. Eventually, we get the patient intubated. And literally a minute later, the patient's heart stops. Mm. We perform CPR. We work on him for 30 minutes. The heart never starts again. We declare him dead. And I called the patient's family. And at three in the morning, the patient's family comes in, about seven or eight people. And here's me, the second year resident, sitting in the conference room, telling them that, we're not sure why we did everything we could, but we're sorry to tell you your family member died. And the family was somber, but accepting. They seemed to have expected this. They knew he was very sick. Eventually they pack up and they leave. And I'm rounding the next morning, about seven in the morning with a big group of doctors and the attending physician. We're going over all the patients for the day, standing at their bedside. And the secretary interrupts us and says, Dr. Grummet, you really need to take this phone call. Now, this was an irregular thing. The secretary's never interrupted us when we were rounding with the other doctors. So I got on the phone and found out that the family that had come and sat in the conference room with me was his new family and his new wife. He actually had three daughters from a previous marriage who had not been included in the loop of everything going on. And in fact, they were estranged from each other too. So I took three phone calls that morning and I talked to three distraught women and had to tell them over the phone that their loved one died. And it was horrendous. It was the worst thing I think I've ever experienced. I mean, you know, one of them cried and screamed and carried on. Another one was just so silent that I didn't know how to interact. One was angry at me um, and I felt deeply guilty for what had happened. And that was a real crack in my feelings about medicine and practicing it. At the time I was standing, what I say is I was standing on an abyss and I thought so much that I was saving myself from stepping back. But what I was really doing was creating these walls to protect myself. And over the next bunch of years, I became a relatively cold person because I had done so much to protect myself Mm -hmm. that I didn't feel anything anymore. But that's what that resident meant when he said that that was John and he couldn't be hurt anymore. By the time I finished residency, after those three years, I couldn't be hurt anymore either. I could walk into the most difficult situation at three in the morning after not sleeping for greater than 24 hours and make important, difficult, life-changing decisions. And it made me a better doctor, but it didn't necessarily make me a better human being. And so that was the beginning of my burnout of medicine, which carried on for years after going into practice. And it was how I eventually learned that I had to transition out of this thing, this thing that I'd always thought was meant to be my purpose in life. The only identity I ever had, it became clear over the years that it wasn't serving me and wasn't bringing me joy. And that was a really hard conclusion to come to. But the beginning was that day in the ICU. Fascinating, powerful story. So through the migration of your medical career, at some point you end up in hospice. And what a lot of times you find out about any story, but really about life uh, by going to the last chapter. And in a way you lived in that last chapter. And so in that last chapter, you're bringing back a lot of valuable life experiences in terms of health and wealth, investment, how you lead a a life that becomes full and complete. Take us through your migration into the hospice and then how you began to listen and learn from people in their final stretch about what inspired you to write this book and think more deeply about life in a way that you never would have if you had not gone through this journey. 
So I got to the point where I was really burned out in medicine and I was looking for a way out. And by that time, I had discovered the world of personal finance. I had gone down the rabbit hole and learned about something called financial independence, a way of moving away from work and using your investments to support you. And so I was looking to build up enough capital to leave medicine. And one way we do that are what are called side hustles, right? They're side jobs. Well, I was a doctor and there were such things as medical side hustles. So being a doctor and being good at end of life care, there were hospices who needed medical directors. And so I could go and see my patients like normal, but then take a few hours each month, sit on some committees and help run some hospice teams and could make extra money doing that. And that could actually improve my income and my net worth to get me to that place where eventually I could leave medicine. So I started doing it as a medical side hustle, um, mm. but fell in love with the actual work. And at some point, I realized after receiving a book from a guy named Jim Dolly, he wrote a book called The White Coat Investor. And I was writing a medical blog at the time, and he sent me his book so that I could review it from my medical blog. And I read it and it taught me all about finances and helped me with all this vocabulary about personal finance that I just didn't understand before. And I realized that I had enough money. And I realized that I could probably stop working and live off of the money I had and the money being made by my investments and could do whatever I wanted, which was exceedingly exciting for about a moment. And then I had a panic attack when I realized that if I left medicine, I wouldn't really know who I was anymore. Like I didn't have a sense of purpose or identity outside of obvious, the obvious stuff like being a husband and a father. But above and beyond that, being a doctor was the only way in which I ever saw myself. So I started a transition that lasted for years in my life of how to cleave my identity and sense of purpose from being a physician and move to other things that were more passionate and joyful for me. The easiest way to do that was actually look at what I was doing first and see if there was anything salvageable there. And so I started what I call the art of subtract and subtraction. I started looking at my current job and getting rid of the things that weren't serving me, as opposed to just throwing the baby out with the bathwater and getting rid of it totally. I started getting rid of the bits and pieces I didn't like. Over years, I got rid of almost everything but hospice. And you see, hospice was the one thing that I would do even if people weren't paying me for it. And that's how I knew it was part of my passion. It was that salvageable part of medicine that really did define me. But I could also do it in such a way that really served me. No nights, no weekends. In fact, I became a consultant for a hospice company and I was working 10 to 15 hours a week and that really served me and that really filled me up and made me feel good. But it also relieved all that space and time in my life. So I was only working 10 to 15 hours a week. All of a sudden I could explore, well, who do I really want to be? Let's go back and start thinking about identity and purpose. What serves me as a person? And I realized that ultimately I'm a communicator. I love having deep conversations. I love writing. I like podcasting. I like public speaking. So in my free time, I started pursuing all these things because I had just learned about personal finance. I was really engaged in the personal finance com community. I started writing a blog about it and eventually a podcast. And I didn't want to have the basic conversations, the kind of conversations you're probably going to cover in a lot of your lectures to come about how to do basic finances. And the reason why is there's lots of great people who are teaching that. I wanted to go a step further and look at the next level of once you start figuring out your money, what does that mean to your life? What is the role money plays in our life? And how do we use money to live a good life? Because clearly I had accumulated enough money that day when I decided I could leave medicine, but I was far from living a good life. So there was a gap there that I felt like I had to solve. So I started this podcast called Earn and Invest, and I had all sorts of people on my podcast, all these experts in real estate and entrepreneurship and money but we all struggled with the same questions. What does this all mean? How does that lead to better happiness? What do we do with money once we have it? And strangely enough, the answers to those questions weren't coming from the personal finance community. They were coming from my dying patients. Hmm. In my hospice work, I was taking care of people who were being told that they had six months or less to live, and it gave them a profound clarity about what was important to them. And I'll get to the punchline quickly, None of them were worried about working more hours. They don't look back at their life and say, boy, I wish I had worked more nights and weekends. Most people don't look back and say, I wish my net worth was a little bit higher. Often what they do is they wish that they took the, had the energy, courage, or time to do those things that were most important to them, but often they didn't. And so 
when we talk about personal finance, we often talk about our monetary investments and things like compounding. What the dying are worried about is their life investments. And they're worried about how their experiences and their love and their joy and their connections compound. And so I'm trying to take some of that financial language, something that was so comfortable for all the people on my podcast, and use it how to show how we can invest in the things that are truly important and bring those things into our life. Money is a great tool. And so we should all be wise about our management of money. But that wise management has to be in service of something more profound and better. And so my goal is to help people find that kind of purpose and identity that serves them that passion so that they can actually use wise money management to get there. Let's go into that because this is a point that we want to get into deeper and the audience appreciates. People often always search for meaning in life. What's their purpose? And as I shared to you before we started here, I had the experience of the hospice with my father and my closest uncle, literally within 48 hours, dying uh, in a room next to each other, my father first, my uncle second. What stunned me in a healthy way about the hospice, it's a place of deep peace. There's a certain calm that entered from my experience. So a two-part question, why was it that the hospice drew you in? You said you would have done it without being paid. It was your call and your purpose in life, number one. So a personal introspection. And then the second part of that is once you discovered on your own, what did you learn from people in hospice? You said they were concerned about, but it, it, it's not a message from the afterlife, but it's people who are a few steps away. And I would think those final months sober you. And as you said, bring clarity to really understand a meaning of life in the way the rest of us can't appreciate so that two part, you personally, the why, and then segue into what you learned from the people in their final months. So hospice made a lot of sense to me. Look, you know, my father died when I was seven and he died suddenly. So he wasn't in hospice. He had a, an aneurysm in his brain and it bled and he died fairly quickly. But I always felt a certain amount of empathy and compassion to dealing with people whose loved ones were dying because I remember what that felt like. And there was no one really there to explain that to me. I was seven years old. He died quickly. We didn't have this big supportive community that had gone through this before. So it was fairly natural when I started medical school. It was actually one of the first things I did was I volunteered for the inpatient hospice at Northwestern University. And so I knew I had a calling. I had a special sensitivity or an empathy to people going through this because I had lived it. And so it made a lot of sense for me to do that type of care. Now, interestingly, I went into general internal medicine, which also gave me the skill set to understand how to use medicines and those type of things to help people be more comfortable at end-of-life care too. So it was a matter of having that sensitivity growing up and then eventually getting the education that gave me the skills to also work in that field but I often say it's the one thing I would do even if I wasn't being paid for it. And part of the reason is one of the things that always felt bad about medicine to me was this pressure of finding the diagnosis and getting things right and making people better. And it ends up being a huge amount of pressure for practitioners and patients alike. What I loved about walking into the hospice settings is usually I was interacting with patients who had already been told by some practitioner or another, there's nothing we can do. And so I get to walk in and talk to these patients and say, no, 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 that's not true at all. There are lots of things we can do. We can control your pain and anxiety. We can have your family gather around and we can help you live every day as these days come and find a sense of purpose or happiness or connections in those days. We can give you as many good days as possible until none are left. And to me, that just felt so optimistic. A lot of people think, boy, you're in hospice. This must be really tough. But I look at it the other way around. Um, I really think it's engaging to be there for people when they've been told that there's nothing we can do and being with them and helping them feel some sense of peace as the end gets near. So I've always felt as it's just an incredibly positive, uplifting thing. And it's so easy for me to use my skill set to help these people 
and it feels so good and important, I can't imagine ever not doing that. And again, that gets back to this idea of even if I wasn't being paid for it, mm -hmm. I still feel strongly and I get to do something. I get to take it even a step further. A lot of what I do nowadays is I run the teams of people who take care of hospice patients. So I get to support the nurses and the chaplains and the certified nursing assistants and the social workers. These are the people who are doing the moment to moment, hands-on difficult care. And I get to be there and back them up and answer their questions and make their lives easier. And I just can't think of a better way to spend my time. So that's why I got into and stayed in hospice to talk about what I've learned from hospice patients. I can't stress it enough how things change when you've been given a terminal diagnosis. I think we often spend a lot of our time as human beings afraid of death. I think we're afraid of the concept of death, and therefore, we tend to put off important things in our lives because they're hard. It's hard to think about purpose and identity. It's hard to look at those things that are really deep down important to you and pursue them. It's hard to look at those relationships that have gone astray and fix them. So instead, we go for low-hanging fruit. In this case, I think that's careers and money and all these social constructs we have of what's important it's much easier to look at those things and shoot for those things. And it's much more socially acceptable. So we spend our, a lot of our lives doing that. And we keep on pushing this important deeper work aside because it's painful because it reminds us that time is finite. And if we start working on this and we don't succeed, one day we may die and never really meet our dreams. And so a lot of times, instead of looking at these things head on, we push them to the side and concentrate on this other stuff. And so what happens when you're told that you're going to die is you no longer have the excuse. <laughs> you no longer have the excuse of running out of time because you are running out of time. And it gives you the sense of clarity that, hey, if there was something I've been putting off because it was too scary or I didn't want to address it, now's the time because there's not going to be any other. And so what we find ourselves doing in hospice is we do something called a life review, which is this structured series of questions where we help people look at their lives, what was important to them, what were their goals, what were their biggest accomplishments, and what were their biggest failures. And we start having them look at their lives and come to terms and peace with that they've accomplished and maybe do those last few things they need to do to feel at peace when they die and I call it the deuce ex machina, right? That's the unexpected plot twist we see in a story where everything isn't going right and all of a sudden something comes and fixes it and it all ends up fine in the, in the end. The problem is we take dying patients and we try to bring about the deuce ex machina. We try to fix everything in their lives because they put it off for so long and now they want peace before they die. My goal with this book, my goal on talking about these things is to relieve you of the need of the last minute plot twist. Like instead of waiting until we're dying and doing these life reviews and trying to figure out what's so important to us, what if we could start doing those things when we're younger? What if we could be doing this on a regular basis? What if we could be really looking into what a sense of purpose and identity looks like to us and building that into our lives now, not waiting until we're financially independent, not waiting until we're retired, not waiting until we have free time, but actually building that into our lives now. The easiest way for me to put this is people say, well, how do I live a good and comfortable death? And I often say people die the way they lived. So if you want to have a good death, you've got to live a good life. And how do you live a good life? Well, you start looking at those things that are important to you. You start pursuing things like purpose now. And so that's the best advice I have from watching the dying over all these years is we need to look seriously at our lives while we're young, while we are not six months away from our deathbeds mm -hmm. and start changing now and start integrating that into our plan, financial or otherwise. Uh, we can't wait till we get to the end of one plan to reach the next. Uh, this uh, space that we're talking in really is the essential element of life to understand life for the gift it is. In your book, you had a line that I actually wrote out. I, I loved the line. It says, wisdom I have gained from the dying. Tell the story of Sam, the story of Charlie, the story of Connor and Connor Sr. Uh, how do we take that and pass it on to our children, our grandchildren, but probably in a way the most difficult 
how do we take that and turn it around and incorporate it into ourselves? Because those are big basket words. My purpose, my meaning. It's as if you have a blank canvas in front of you and rather than color the dots where somebody gives me a picture ahead of time, like you said, go for this certain career, live in this certain place, go to these certain schools. Now I have a blank canvas in front of me. That's daunting, which is why we find refuge in the things that are defined for us. So take us into the wisdom you've gained from the dying as in those final months, how they do find purpose and clarity, and then how we can bring it back to ourselves and our younger generations. So there's several techniques and people really get anxious when we bring up this word purpose. And I often say capital P purpose, right? This idea that we have this one purpose that drives our whole lives. And if we don't find it and act on it, then we're going to be bereft. And I think that creates a lot of stress. I often talk to people about little P purpose, which means we probably have multiple different purposes in life. And the goal is not to find that one big one, but to fill up more of our time with things that feel purposeful, small p purposeful. So the dying have great advice here. And in fact, the process we go through with the dying could really help people way earlier on in their trajectory. So the simplest thing is to ask yourself that question. If I found out I was going to die today, what would I regret never having the energy, courage, or time to do, right? And this is not something that you answer immediately. It's something that you take a lot of time to think about. That is a short form of the life review. This is the same life review that we do with hospice patients, but ultimately we should probably be doing these type of life review questions on a regular basis. I think it's the greatest way to first get to the heart of the issue of what is that thing if I didn't accomplish or at least try that I would regret on my deathbed. There are lots of other little techniques, right? Sometimes I tell people like, what was your dream or goal as a child? Remember when we were children and our ideas were unfettered by social norms or what we thought or we could or couldn't accomplish? Often those dreams and those interests of childhood get buried and the traditional career and the traditional expectations of family, friends, and society. So often I try to get people to go back to tell me what was your biggest, wildest dream of childhood? Um, what interested you, right? When you weren't worried about money and you weren't worried about career and you were just being a little kid, what type of things drew you in? I think we get these whispers in our psyche that tell us the things we want to do. And I think we often don't listen to them. So another leading question I often ask people is, when was the last time you woke up in the middle of the night excited by an idea and you couldn't go back to sleep? We've all had these moments where an idea, a concept, something did this to us. And what mostly happens? Most of the time we eventually get back to sleep at two in the morning, we wake up exhausted the next day and we bury it. We convince ourselves that that's too audacious, or that's not something I have time to do, or that was a silly thought in the middle of the night. And then we move on with our lives. I think those moments are those whisperings to us of what's important. And often we ignore them. So the idea is how do we learn how not to ignore these things that are important in our life? If you try all these things, you try a life review, you think about what you liked during childhood, you remember those moments of waking up excited with an idea in the middle of the night, and none of that helps then you got to throw the spaghetti against the wall and see what sticks, which means signing up for courses, meeting new people, doing things that make you feel uncomfortable mm -hmm. and finding what feels right. And again, it doesn't mean that you have to find something that is ultimately what you're going to spend the rest of your life doing. But the way I look at it is time is immutable. We have a set amount of time on this earth. We don't know how many years that's going to be, but you can't buy it. You can't sell it. You can't trade it. All you can do is maybe have a modicum of control over what activities you are involved in as time passes. So my goal is to help people fill as much of that time with activities that bring a sense of joy and purpose. So if you go and you volunteer for a whole bunch of things and you find a few that are to your liking, at least you've then spent some of that time doing something that felt like it was purposeful you're doing a better job of filling more of your time with these important activities. I think if you do enough of that, you'll eventually find things that speak to you. Those things don't have to change the world. In fact, they can be downright selfish. It just depends on who you are and what you want. The point is, are these things that help drive you, help make you feel like the activities you've put in those time slots in your life 
are well spent. And so that's kind of the goal. And I think that's how we start looking into purpose. That, that, so you, you listen to the whispers, uh, you listen to your dreams, you listen to what happens in the middle of the night in a way like you did uh, early on at seven. But then you also, not just from internalized, you get out into the world and move around through a range of activities. And in that range, you will suddenly realize maybe in the moment or after the moment, boy, I felt timeless in that moment. That's where I need to be. Yeah, that's and another great, and so that's purpose. And in the book, I talk about purpose, identity, and connections. They're three separate things, but they're really all part of the same. If you're really struggling with purpose, the next thing to do is start doing some exercises to figure out how you identify. And you know, a great exercise to do with that is to ask yourself the question, I am, and then fill in the blank. And mm -hmm. I go through this in the book and it's something that there's several iterations. So usually if you start asking yourself, I am the first thing you're going to answer is, you know, I did, I am a doctor, right? It was my profession, something that no longer really fits my identity. But it's funny. That was the first thing that happened. Usually after that, you'll start talking about relationships. I am a father, I'm a son, I'm a spouse, right? All of those kind of things are important, but they don't necessarily define uniquely who you are. Eventually, if you keep on asking yourself, I am, and you iterate, you get to like accomplishments. I'm a Plutus award winning, we're award winner for the Earn and Invest podcast. Again, accomplishments feel good and you can talk about what you've achieved. But if you keep on pushing further and further, I know I did. What I eventually came to is I'm a communicator. Like I like to have deep conversations. I like to podcast. I like to write. I like to public speak. It took me a long time to get there. But eventually I was able to see that this purpose that I thought I had being a physician didn't fit me. I would go to medical school. In fact, my whole time in medical school, I had almost no really close medical friends. When I was a practicing physician, I avoided the doctor's lounge assiduously. And even when my wife and I would go to parties, I'd actually be embarrassed to tell new people what I did for a living. And this was all telling me that that identity that I was wearing on my outside like a cloak wasn't fitting that internal identity. And only when I realized that being a communicator felt right to me, that I started a living the life consistent with that. And I started going to a bunch of personal finance conferences and I met a bunch of writers and bloggers and podcasters. And I felt more comfortable with those people within five minutes than doctors I had known for decades. And so you start figuring purpose and you start bringing identity into it. And then ultimately that leads you to connecting more deeply with other people around you. And that's, that's kind of the goal. That's very insightful. As you moved into different environments and communities, suddenly you realized for at least this time, that's where you belong. Yeah. Yeah. And that led to connection. Cause ultimately I think the end goal with purpose and identity is it leads you to those deeper connections and relationships. Um, and I think that's what fills us up, right? Again, we talk about investing in stocks and bonds, but we, when you invest in your own sense of purpose and identity, what you're doing is really investing in relationships that will pay dividends in love and joy and connection for the rest of your life. Clearly. So as you think about this, let's take it and personalize it as we think about our children and our grandchildren. With your two children, how do you teach them effectively this philosophy of life that you live through and learn but at the same time, you just don't want to give it to them. You want them to earn it as well. How do you pass it on to your next generation? What can we learn from what you're doing for our generations? So first and foremost, we talk about didactic teaching, right? You can sit your children down and say, this is what purpose looks like in your life, and this is how you pursue it. But we all know that doesn't work really well, right? You can try to teach your children by didactic teaching. That kind of works somewhat. What really helps is modeling. So the best way I can teach my children is actually live a purposeful and identity-driven life now, and they can see me negotiate the world that way. So I think we often discount how important that is, but providing good modeling for your children, which means working through these things yourself, is a very good way to teach them. And then lastly is allowing them to to actually get out there and live life and fail in safe ways, right? So the idea is you create a safe environment for them to learn by doing. Um, and so sometimes instead of, for instance, taking your children and forcing them to play violin, which we did with our kids, or forcing them to do a sport, 
sometimes you got to let them go and and find out what they want to do. Maybe it's something you wouldn't have wanted to do. Maybe you have to give them unstructured playtime, which of course sounds horrible to parents nowadays. Um, But maybe you have to let them pursue their sense of joy and purpose unfettered uh, and give them that space and free time to do some of the things they want to do and see where their interest carries them. Um, So I think if we model that kind of good behavior, if we allow them a safe place to investigate and yet fail safely, I think we throw in a little bit of that didactic teaching, talking about them when they hit barriers, right? And they hit hurdles, talking about why they hit that barrier and and how to work on that. And I think the last thing we can do is if we really want to help our children build a purposeful life, we also have to model and teach them a little bit about that financial framework to support that. So right now we've been spending most of our talk here talking about purpose and identity, but Taking Stock really is also a personal finance book. The second piece, the first piece is figuring out who you are and who you want to be, figuring out purpose. But the second piece is then using that to build a financial framework and a structure to support that purposeful life. And so I think it's also important for our kids to see us modeling good financial behavior in order to support those things we think are important. Given that you've laid the foundation for us, how to lead a full and purposeful life, how to get a sense of your identity, your passions, and live in that then how do we build the financial structure to basically support that? What are the few things that you'll pass on to us and our audience and future audiences that are very practical that we can put to work? So the goal ultimately when it comes to your money is to be what I call financial independent or financially independent. There are lots of different definitions. And in fact, for different people, that definition is different depending on what path in life you decide to go on. But ultimately, the idea is financial independence is having enough money to spend your life doing those purposeful things you want to do. And so that's the definition I really like. And so in the book, I spend a lot of time talking about something called the parable of the three brothers. And I tell a story in the book about the three different paths to financial independence. One path is the path I took, which is I did a job which I eventually didn't like, but I grinded it out. I saved lots and lots of money. I put that money in the stock market and let it grow until I got to a net worth number. And it's in the book and we could talk about it if you want to, but it's not really relevant at the moment. You can calculate out what that net worth number is so that you can stop working and do whatever you want. So the idea is you front load the sacrifice, grind it out. Maybe you don't pursue purpose and identity early on in your career, but you make lots of money. And then you get to the point where you can leave work and spend the rest of your life pursuing that purpose and identity. In the parable of the three brothers, that's the path of the eldest brother. That is one way to financially become financially independent. You still need to understand what your sense of purpose is and what your identity is, but you agree to maybe put them on the back burner for a little while to get to where you need financially to then spend the rest of your life doing those things. That's one path, the path of the eldest brother. The path of the middle brother is something called passive income and side hustles. Whereas the eldest brother has to really wait until they get to the point where they have enough money to never work again. People who are interested in passive income or side hustles are building these jobs, these things that they can do, which within a few years of hard work will eventually lead to money coming in with a lot less work. And so they get financially independent faster, but they define financial independence as making enough money with their passive income or side hustles to cover their monthly needs. So unlike the eldest brother, where you need enough money that you never have to make a cent again, the middle brothers who are going for passive income and side hustles just want that money they're creating through these businesses or real estate or whatever they put forth to cover their monthly needs and still give them some time to start doing the things they want. So instead of putting off purpose and identity for years while they're getting to a huge net worth number, they start integrating that within the first few years because the revenue streams are freeing freeing them up sooner. So that's the path of the middle brother. And last but not least, the path of the youngest brother in this parable is the passion play. So if the whole goal of financial independence is to live a life of purpose and identity, what if you find a job, a job you would do even if you weren't being paid for it, a job that fulfills your sense of purpose and identity, and it happens to pay your monthly bills? Well, in a sense, you're financially independent immediately. So those are three different paths to get to financial independence. But again, the key really is that those paths are just a framework to live a life of purpose and identity. So you have to define what purpose and identity are first. And then you can start saying, 
well, what works for me? And so I've, you know, put out three separate paths, but the truth of the matter is we can take little bits from each. So I started as a youngest brother. I wanted to be just like my dad. I was passionate about becoming a doctor. I didn't care what it paid me just as long as I could make a living doing it. So I was the youngest brother. I was going for the passion play. But eventually I burned out in medicine and started asking myself, well, how much money do I need to have to quit work altogether? So I went from being a youngest brother to an eldest brother who was front-loading the sacrifice. I wanted to take work off the table so that I could then live a purposeful life. But while becoming the eldest brother, I also started doing these medical side hustles, one of which was hospice. So I all of a sudden also became the middle brother because I was doing some passive income and some side hustles that were getting me to financial independence sooner. At some point, I got to enough money and I got rid of everything I didn't like about my job, except which was passion driven. And that ended up being hospice. So ultimately, I ended up like a youngest brother again, just doing what made me passionate and using that money that I made from it to support myself. So ultimately, I don't care what path you take. You can switch back and forth from time to time, from one path to the other. You can integrate different aspects of each path. But again, the idea is to be intentional so that you can build this financial framework so it can ultimately support you filling your time with things that are important. Your story is a parable. It's a journey. It's mythology. It's going through the three brothers and returning back to your origin. And in that whole journey that you've had, that's because you took chances and moved around and tried a variety of things. And in your book, you talk about, as you get into the portions of uh, financial advice and metrics, you talk about the 4% rule, which I think is a pretty interesting one. If you can share that and other tangential ones for our audience. Sure. I mean, there are a few major personal fin finance concepts that everyone should know, right? One is net worth, right? When you take your assets and your liabilities and you subtract them and see what your monetary worth is, that's a big one. Um, another is this thing called the safe withdrawal rate or the 4% rule. So years and years ago, there was a study called the Trinity study where they tried to answer a specific question. Financial advisors have been interested in this for years. This idea of how much can you draw off existing assets that are invested reasonably? How much can you draw off every year and not empty the pot, right? So the idea is we have people who are thinking about retirement. They've got to a certain net worth. That money is invested in whether in real estate or stocks or bonds, how much can that retired person draw off their portfolio every year and still make it 30 years and have money left over or at least make it to that 30-year mark? So the idea was, what is the safe withdrawal rate? What percentage of our assets can we spend every year to support our lifestyle and still use that pot to fund the rest of our retirement? And so they looked at consecutive 20 and 30 year periods throughout the stock market from, I don't know, 1900 to 2000. And they found that 4.1 or so was a safe withdrawal rate that you could withdraw 4.1% annually adjusted for inflation from your general net worth. And you had a very high likelihood of making it 30 years and having enough money, right? It was something like 95 or 98%. So that's called the safe withdrawal rate and or the 4% rule. We've rounded it down to 4% and say that generally, if you have enough money to withdraw 4%, that should last you at least 30 years. So if you have a million dollars worth of invested assets, you should be able to live off of $40,000 a year for at least 30 years. Mm -hmm. So that's called the 4% rule. A corollary to that is the 25 times rule. It just flips it upside down and says, if you spend $40,000 a year, multiply that by 25, which comes out to a million dollars, that's how much money you need invested in the stock market in stocks and bonds to support you for the next 30 years. There's all sorts of debate about what that number should be. Some people say 4%. Some people say, boy, the stock market's going to do horrible in the next 10 years, so it should be 3.3%. There's all sorts of argument, and they really stem from this idea of what's called sequence of returns risk, 
what we're really worried about is if you retire and you have a million dollars there and it's all invested, if you have a particularly bad first 10 years of retirement and the investment returns are low, you're going to draw off too much from that portfolio and you'll never be able to recover. And so that's the risk. And so that's a major financial concept. And if you're interested in, again, building that life you want to live, living a life of purpose, it serves you to understand these financial concepts so you can understand how much money you need saved and how to utilize it to support that life you're trying to live. You find that you've made it a practice to live below your means? So I am unlike a lot of people who, so the, the financial independence movement actually really has grown through what's called the FIRE movement, Financial Independence Retire Early, which is a group of people who in their 20s and 30s were saying, how can I accumulate enough money to never work again because they didn't like their jobs? And so I came from that community and that community is incredibly frugal. So I am by no means frugal. We spend a lot of money. It just is what it is between help around the house and my daughter got bullied at school. So we had to send her to private school and we live in a very pricey neighborhood with really high real estate taxes. So we by no means live a frugal life. On the other hand, through investing, et cetera, and I've cut my, my income down quite a bit by going into hospice and only doing it for 10 to 15% of, of the work week, I still find that I probably don't spend as much as I could. So I think it's very natural, especially for people who do the spreadsheets and who do the deep thinking about this to be conservative. Um, one of the things that's magical, which I always talk to people about is we get caught up on how much money you need to retire, but it does amazing things to work just a little bit. So if you have just a little income coming in, if we say the 4% rule is 95 or 98% safe, but there's always that 5% that it could fail. But then let's say you bring in a fourth of your normal income by getting rid of everything you don't like in your job and just doing things you like to do. Well, that effectively drive, drops your safe withdrawal rate from a four to even a 3% or a 2%, which are incredibly safe. You're probably not going to run out of money. So the way I look, I like to look at it in terms of abundance. Instead of getting to the point where I'm worried that I'm going to run out, I can do things like hop, hospice, which are purposeful to me. And being a young person, I'm probably going to still make some money. And that money allows me to not really worry about the bottom line as much because I'm making more than I need. And I've already accumulated money that's working for me in the stock market and other places while I sleep. And so I think all of us should start building that type of financial framework where we can just choose to do the work we love doing. If we happen to make some money from that, it makes us extra safe. Or I like to turn that around and say, we can have extra amazing vacations or buy extra cool stuff and not worry about it affecting our overall trajectory. You have charts in your books about Americans versus other cultures, the amount of time that we work, staying up late working and whatnot. There's the old story that nobody ever put on their tombstone, I wish I had spent more time in the office. Mm -hmm. uh, so what do you, do you find in a way Americans tick different than other cultures? Are other cultures actually embrace the philosophy we're talking about, maybe more mature cultures who have that wisdom of how to live a full life? So I have the benefit of working, of having a wife who works in a multinational company and she regularly interacts with people from all over Europe and Asia, et cetera. You know, there are a lot of countries where, for instance, they have protected time off in the summer. They get a lot more weeks off. Their hours are a lot less. Now, I will say that many countries have also started moving in the direction of the US, but we tend to work a lot of nights and weekends here. We tend to work a longer work week. Um, and we tend to invest a lot in our jobs. And in fact, you know, part of the American dream is you get a job you love. And we always talk about, you know, this idea that we should be passionate about our jobs, which I even talk about this idea of the youngest brothers passionate about their jobs, but a lot of people aren't. And so with the advent of emails and cell phones and the internet, we're all more connected to work than ever. And I think culturally, we have more of that in the US than other places. And I don't think it's 100% healthy for us. Um, there's a lot more to life than work. I think it's fantastic when you find purpose, identity, and connections in the workplace. Um, but I think we should also develop that outside the workplace too. Exactly. So in our closing five minutes here, um, if at this phase of life, you had a chance to go back 
and meet the younger Jordan at the age of seven, what advice would you share from to him? I mean, because you've gone through a journey where you've learned about life by taking chances, taking risks, exploring that, and you've passed it on to your chill children. But if you could go back and advise Jordan at seven, what might you recommend and say to him? It's interesting because, right, we are a product of our experiences and I like where I've ended up. So it's hard to go in and dissect what I would have changed or not. But there is something I think very clearly about which would have been an alternate path to the same place. And it really resolves around that time right in medical school when I discovered hospice work. I was volunteering as a hospice volunteer and I knew it felt good and I knew it felt right. But a part of me decided that I wasn't going to do that for a living. Maybe it was I wouldn't make enough money doing it. Maybe it was I wanted to be the great investigator that an internist is, and I didn't feel that doing the hospice work would fulfill that. Whatever it was, I convinced myself to not listen to those whispers about what I was meant to do. And I pursued a career in internal medicine, which I eventually burned out from. I made a lot of money doing it. It allowed me to get to financial independence faster. But what if instead I had gone back and I decided to be a hospice palliative care doc at the beginning of my career? I wouldn't have made as much money. I probably wouldn't be at financial independence right now. I'd still be working on my way there. On the other hand, I would have felt a sense of joy and purpose in what I was doing. Maybe I would have never burned out in the first place. And so this gets back to this idea of understanding a sense of purpose and identity before you start building your financial life. If I had a better understanding of my purpose at the beginning of my career, my career might have looked much different. I might have had more career longevity. Um, so I think often about that. So I guess my advice to myself would be the same advice that I think this book gives to everyone is you need to start thinking about purpose now and not wait until you feel you're established. Um, because Understanding your sense of purpose and identity now will allow you to have a lot more meaningful work life as well as home life and personal life on top of it. You're a mentor to your children, but it sounds like in a way you were a mentor to yourself, you know, and there was a, the, the one uh, chief resident that took you around basically gave you an insight. Now this other resident that was moving on no longer had to feel pain and you reflected on that. Do we need a mentor in life? In addition, did you have a mentor that made a difference? Well, I've had lots of mentors, starting with my dad, right? Part of the reason I went into medicine. Um, it depends in what field you're talking about. Like, I'm a podcaster. I love podcasting. Uh, Terry Gross, who I've never met before, is a mentor just because she's an amazing po you know, podcaster, interviewer for NPR. Um, I think my hospice patients in this case were really my mentors. Like it was through my hospice patients that I really was able to finally put into perspective all these things happening in my life, as well as in the lives of community members who are struggling with these money issues and really made sense of it. So I think we have many mentors. Like you said, I think we can be our own mentors. I think our parents are our mentors. I think we end up having mentors when we have special relationships with people we work with. I think our spouses mentor us. I think the idea is being open to the wisdom that all these people have to teach us. Um, there's lots and lots of wisdom out there. And if we take the time, open ourselves and, and pay attention, we can be mentored by many people. And I think that's kind of how my path uh, laid out in front of me. In our closing two minutes, uh, you said this book, uh, Taking Stock, really is at this phase of life, you've said all you need to say, but beyond this, you're thinking of a series. What might come next that we should be looking out for? So I've said in a lot of ways that taking stock was a, a little bit of my closing statement. I used to do a lot of medical legal work, right? So at the end of the case, the lawyers put out their closing statement, which is a summation. So taking stock for me was really a summation of all I've been thinking about and writing about medicine and personal finance since about 2004, 2005, when I started a blog about medicine. So I don't know if I have a lot more to say about personal finance. I do still have a lot to say about our healthcare system. So besides writing about personal finance, I've spent many years lecturing and public speaking about our healthcare system and what works and doesn't work in it. And I'm working currently on a book proposal to write a book about how third parties have leveraged our healthcare system to extract all the money out of it and have pretty much caused our system to break down. And then 
I have a unique solution for that. And so I want to really write about what I think the solution to this problem is. Can you share that briefly now for what to look forward to? So the, the unique solution is if you look at the things that have gone wrong in with, with large complex systems, especially in the United States, ultimately what brings about change isn't exactly legislation. I mean, you need legislation to change things. But what really changes and causes revolutions, especially within the United States, is when the main stakeholders come together and refuse to accept the status quo. And the reason why is the way our political system works is they're entrenched interests who don't want the world to change. And if we mm -hmm. want the world to change, we as the main stakeholders have to show powerfully that we're coming together as allies and we won't accept anything other than change. And usually the match in the fire that causes this is storytelling. So I believe what the answer to our healthcare system today is shared storytelling between healthcare practitioners and the people we care for. I'll give you a few examples of how this plays out. Let's look at a non-medical example. Uh, let's look at the civil rights movement. I mean, the story of Rosa Parks was one of the things that really brought together all these disparate forces and gave a huge amount of steam to the civil rights movement. Um, let's talk about the meatpacking industry in Chicago in the 1920s. Upton Sinclair wrote a book called The Jungle, which changed the way manufacturing was regulated for decades and maybe even centuries to come. It's this storytelling that changes the world. I'll give you a medical example. I forget the name of the author, but the National Health Service, which is the UK's version of universal health care, didn't come into being until I believe the late 1930s. The idea for it happened in the early 1900s. There were a lot of social and progressives who were pushing for this change, seeing the atrocities of the British healthcare system and the inability for people to afford it. But during and in between the two world wars, nothing ever happened. And then there was this doctor who wrote a book called The Citadel, in which he documented through fictional tales all the bad things of the British healthcare system and all the people who are suffering because they didn't have enough money to get healthcare. And currently, if you look today, the formation of the NHS is actually attributed to the writing of this book. Mm -hmm. So the ideas were all there, but the only thing that truly got the stakeholders together and caused this fundamental change was that this doctor wrote a fictional tale called The Citadel. And I think that's happening today in the United States, but on a much smaller level. So if you look at people like Atul Gawande, who wrote the Checklist Manifesto and um, his recent book about end-of-life care, uh, Being Mortal, he's a storyteller. And he's using these stories and his medical knowledge to change the face of medicine today. Because of Atul Gawande, we use checklists in operating rooms and it's caused a huge cut down in medical errors because of a tool Gawande. We're much more sensitive to end of life care and we're using hospice and palliative care more than ever since the writing of his book. We have these storytellers out there and we need to expand on that and start telling our stories about healthcare and about the doctor patient relationship and using that as fodder to bring about allyship and eventually causing grassroots fundamental healthcare revolution. Well, Jordan, this has been excellent. And the way that you just concluded, I think is the best place for us to conclude here because it's the power of the story that brings it all together. And that's what you've done for us today in this opening talk here for our upcoming series of seminars and speakers. You're being our opening speaker here, our keynote for our financial fundamentals. And we do look forward to the next series that you come up with the next book. In the meantime, to our audience here and those who tune in, by all means, Taking Stock by Dr. Jordan Grummet, um, just recently out, a strong recommend, two copies here in the Summit Library, also online available. Jordan, and closing Fred. thoughts. Oh, Go I'm sorry. Here. I just wanna interrupt. Um, um... Did I wanted to make sure nobody had any questions? I see a question in there. Do you have any advice for older people who may not have lived as successful, perfect a life as you have advocated and may have regrets? 
So my advice to people who are feeling like it's getting to be too late or feel like they're later in life, I've seen fundamentally people change in the six months since they got a terminal diagnosis and before they die. So the deus ex machina, although it's not the way I think everyone should do it, the last minute plot twist exists. If people who are dying can fundamentally change and reach some of their dreams, then any of us, whether we're five years away, 10 years away, 20 years away, or even 12 months away, I think we can all start looking at pursuing a sense of purpose. Like I said, we only have a certain amount of time on this earth. My goal is that you spend as much of that time doing purposeful things. So you might not have spent the first 60 or 70 years of your life doing those purposeful things, but I'd love for you to be able to fill the rest of your time doing those things finding out what's important to you and enjoying yourself in whatever time you have left. Rebecca, thank you for that catch. Excellent question. Jordan, just on that, then in the people that uh, went to work on what you advised, what did you see shift in them that made their final days, weeks, months fulfilled? So ultimately, especially in hospice patients, what we're looking for is a sense of peace. So for some people that might be getting in touch with someone who they had a great relationship with, but fell apart, right? For other people, maybe their wish was to be a professional basketball player. Well, that's never going to happen, but maybe we can get them to that one last live game or connect them with a famous basketball player and they can relive some of that, of that joy. Ultimately, we don't necessarily need everyone to succeed at those things that are important to them. We don't even have to we don't even have to get them exactly what it is what they want. The idea is you don't tend to regret what you tried and failed or you gave your best shot at. We tend to regret what we never gave ourselves the permission to try. And so the goal is, yeah, it's not perfect at the end of life, but we try to connect people with those things that were important to them. We try to close some of those loops. And so let's drop perfection and let's start looking at good enough. What would make you feel more connected with your life today? What are the proxies you could use, even if you can't ultimately do that thing, what you want to do? How can you fail in the pursuit of something important and yet know that on your deathbed, you'll say, I gave it my best. And I think that's what our real goal is. So drop perfection, good enough, get out there and take a chance. And, live. Yeah. and don't be afraid of failure because again, it won't be your failure you regret. It's going to be your unwillingness to try. So in the final thoughts here, how do you define failure? Is it more experimentation, learning about life through doing? So how do I define failure? Well, failure is if you have a preset goal and don't meet it. What I like to tell people is if you can start doing things that feel meaningful for you in the process, it doesn't really matter if you reach the goal or not. So if you start really understanding, like, I'm going to fill my time with things where I truly enjoy the process and whether I get to that huge goal or not doesn't matter as much, then the only failure really there is is if you don't enjoy what you're doing on the way there. So it's the climb. We have to enjoy the climb, not only the destination. The mountain climber, enjoying the climb, enjoying the, uh, the journey on the way yeah. up. Yeah, wonderful. Any other well, questions? I'm sorry, Fred. It's okay. Rebecca, do you have any questions? Uh, no. Um, if there are no more questions, do you have any more questions, Fred? Oh, just a request that we have Jordan back in the future. <laughs> I'll yeah. be happy to come back anytime. We'd love to continue the conversation. This has been superb. Jordan, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. And, and Rebecca, thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> All right. <laughs> thank you, Jordan. And thank you, Fred, for a fascinating com and useful conversation. Yes, yes. Yeah. Is there one final question there that we see? No, that was already answered. Oh, just a thank you. Okay, good. Yes. We're good to go. Jordan, thank, thank you. you again. Appreciate it. All Take the best. Have a, have a great life. Bye. Bye. Bye.